All right, first day of summer. Welcome to OMB Warehouse, Facebook land. Ah, just going to get warmed up. Uh, tonight we're going to be assembling the Predator non-Hemi 212. Um, got everything laid out behind me and uh, just waiting for everybody to join in. And uh, then we'll get going. I always like to start early because I don't like to be late. And if I was late, then I couldn't enjoy my OMB Warehouse Coconut. Oh, that's delightful. Yes, Tom Engine, good to see you, brother. Happy first day of spring, huh? That's right, I'm feeling festive today. Can you hear me okay? Tonight we're going to be assembling that uh, non-hemi Predator. Um, that's right. It's always a party here at the Grey Go Garage. That's what helps keep me so fat. And the wife's got me on a diet, man. I'm starving. I could eat the rear end out of a skunk right now. But uh, Nick, good to see you. Arizona in the house. So, yeah, she got me on a diet. We're going to Panama in September, and um, she wants to see me in a Speedo, which ain't going to happen. Come on, man. We're not, we're not going to go there. American Mini Bikes. Oh, come on, man. You don't have to work. Easy E in the house. Eric, I know you want one of them gray goat shirts like all the cool kids have. You got to play along, brother. Get your Google skills down. George, good to see you, brother. Thanks again for that engine. Yeah, Tom, I do have a seafood diet. Um, you know, if I don't eat 1,200 calories a day, I just uh, balloon up like a madman, like somebody's got an air hose up my woo-hoo. Yeah, so, um, yeah, that's what I do. I like my beer, too, but, uh, you know, tonight we're enjoying some cool Arizona mini bike riders water. And look at that, fresh cap, see? I'm not cheating on you guys. I got water tonight because uh, I'm thinking I'm probably going to work up a sweat. Uh, I'm going to try and move the camera over so you can see me work. Uh, I know you'll miss my beautiful face. You can't have everything, right? Because if you had everything, where would you put it? Even with a bigger garage. Um, Wolf in the house. Good to see you, David. Um, now, I didn't brace this block up, David. So, uh, you know, you'll you'll have to, to play along to my sensibilities. This is a real mild build. Um, this uh, engine, Evan, good to see you, brother. Aloha to you as well, sir. Happy first day of summer. Um, I picked me up another Gilson. I haven't done a mini bike in gosh, over a year now. And, uh, I'm missing it. I'm lonely. Um, I had to go into therapy and, uh, Angelo's in the house. Angelo provided me with the, with the beautiful Bosch wheel to complete this, uh, monkey wards Gilson bike that I'm going to build. Um, the engine behind me, that's going to go on there, which is the uh, predator 212 non Hemi. Yeah. <laughs> Thank you, David. I appreciate that. Um, and uh, it's going to have a torque converter. And I'm trying to work out some hydraulic brakes for it, too. I'm thinking about using that doodlebug uh, setup and uh, mounting a disc on the back. Um, you guys all saw that uh, uh, Pete, Dr. Shopkeeper, with his $20,000 Gilson, um, guy did a lot of work. And, you know, I applaud him for that. He uh, is very creative and um, he's very determined. Um, I don't think I have that kind of patience, but, um, you know, it's, it's a beautiful bike. And uh, I know he won a ribbon out there at Winber. So thanks for joining in. Um, this is OMBWarehouse.com. This is Eric. I am Eric. And you're in the Grey Go Garage. This is where the magic happens in the Grey Go Garage. And uh, tonight we're going to work on that um, work on that engine behind us. I'm going to uh, hopefully get uh, mostly built with the exception of the tins. Uh, I know uh, Neck wants me to fire it up tonight, but that ain't going to happen. Come on, who, who can build an engine in less than an hour? It just doesn't work. Um, <laughs> uh, yeah. Oh, and Cliff's in the house right now. Yeah. Good to see you, Cliff. Yeah, we're not starting this engine up tonight. You know, my, my weak arms can't handle the pull on this high-compression engine. So tonight we're going to build the Predator 212. 
um, I've got the uh, 14cc head prepped to go on. I had to drill out uh, the dowel pin holes on it um, to fit that because it was a clone head, but we don't care about that. We'll make it work, right? I got a drill bit, and uh, I can drill straight as a knot arrow. Um, so we're, we'll, uh, we'll get started on that, and um, I'm going to move the camera over so you guys aren't going to be able to see my face. And uh, sorry about that. I know how pretty I am, and I know how you guys look forward to seeing me. And, you know, my, my mama uh, told me n never work on equipment with, you know, stuff hanging around your neck because you get sucked in. And uh, we don't want to get sucked in. Let me let me show you the, the, the bones of the Gilson bike that uh, I'm going to be building. And uh, I'll be building this weekly here on Facebook Live. So uh, just got a ton of parts coming in from OMBWarehouse.com. Uh, I'll be mocking it up, making a roller out of it, and getting everything situated before I start uh, hammering on it and taking it to the powder coater. So um, here we go. Let's see if we can get you over there to see that. That is my bare bones Monkey Wards Gilson bike. And uh, that, that bike, uh, it, it's actually pretty solid. It has a few cracks up in the front uh, on the fork plate, but uh, not, nothing that can't be fixed. Um, Angelo, thank you again for that wheel on the front. Um, it, it is ugly, but uh, I'll have Sam Bennett uh, Cambo 61 on old mini bikes run it through the burnisher and make it pretty. And um, it, it's going to need a lot of help, a lot of work uh, going to go into this bike here. The wife wants it sparkly orange. And um, if the wife's going to ride it, I got to have good brakes on it because she's a little clumsy. So um, good, good bones right there. Very solid bikes, the Gilsons, all one inch tube and uh, real thick. So that, that'll be a solid rider, suspension on both ends. And uh, the Predator 212 that we're going to build tonight is going to go on there with a torque converter. And uh, I'm, I'm actually really excited to build another bike. It's been a long time. Uh, Dallas, good to see you in the house, man. Stay cool out there. My neighbors are heading out there tomorrow, and it's over 100 degrees out there in Arizona. So before we get started, let's start on a question. You guys ready? I know normally I start a quarter after the hour, so we get more people uh, participating. But, um, you know, if you're late, you snooze, you lose. It's just too darn bad. Hold on. I got to hydrate with my OMBWarehouse.com fake coconut. Nice, right? All right, you guys ready for the first question? Yeah, I know, David, but, you know, anybody that knows David Wolf knows he's the king of the doodlebug. So um, leave Angelo alone. He, he's a nice guy once a week, just not on Thursdays. Um, all right, you guys ready for the first question? Oh, 110 in Dallas. Uh, no Kool-Aid tonight, Tom. Sorry, brother. All right. We all want this mini bike. It's the Bug Flea. And uh, the, the bugs were made here in Los Angeles, and uh, they were fantastic little bikes, but they're tiny. Um, uh, big fat guy like me looks like a, like the circus is coming to town, and the neighbors point and laugh at me, so I, I wouldn't ride one. But they certainly are neat little bikes. Um, the Bug Flea came with some unique wheels that uh, you don't see a lot of anymore, and they're, they're kind of valuable at this point. What is the name of the manufacturer of the wheels on the Bug Flea? Was it aluminum wheel? No, it's not Azusa. Yeah, I should have some wine punch. But Mrs. Goat's not home tonight, so. Oh, George, in with hands. George Para has one in the pipe. Hands wheels were on the... Uh, we're on the Bug Flea. Um, Bug Flea is a way cool little bike. The hands, wheels, very solid, very sought after. Uh, if you have some and you know what they look like, don't sell them for cheap on eBay. Or don't don't sell them to James like I did cheap. Um, Could have got more money on them. So um, George Parra, first in the house with hands, wheels. So George is on the board with one point. Nice, George. Nice. Okay. Mama told me never to work with stuff around my neck when I'm working with equipment. I need to move the camera over. And we're going to get started building this engine. All right? All right. Everybody was quacking at me. I can't see. I can't see. Well, you probably still can't see, but that's not my problem. Uh, 
Okay, here we go. All right, so what you see here is I've got my bare block and I've got everything prepped, everything cleaned. I've already lapped in the flywheel. Um, we already uh, set the clearance, you know, made sure that the clearance was right in, in the bearings for the crank. So, so we're good there. So first thing we do is, you know, make sure your block's clean, got no junk inside of it. And uh, let's get it lubed up a little bit. I always like to take a little bit of oil, 30 weight in my, in my squirt bottle and just lube this bearing here in the back. For those guys that don't take their spark plug out and turn their engine a bunch of times, that's important so you don't uh, starve that bearing for oil. I, I cleaned this really well and I know it was dry. So the other part I don't want to do is I don't want to run that seal on the other side dry. So I got some oil on there. I've got some oil on the crank. And we'll just stab this crank in real quick. One thing I like to do because I'm not as strong as Cliff is I'm just going to put the flywheel on real quick. Put the crank right there. And you'll notice I already put the key in because keys are, are really tough for me. What the heck? See, very first thing we do, then I start having issues. It's because you guys are watching and I know it. There we go. So what I'm going to do is I'm just going to put the, the cup in and make sure that the the little uh, nipple here is indexed into the little spot that they provide, that ARC provides on this flywheel. And I'm just, I'm just going to hand tighten this nut down on here. I want to use the flywheel to turn the engine while I'm building it, but it's not tightened. So I'm going to take a piece of blue tape and I'll put blue tape here. That tells me that there's something going on with this and I'll need to address that before we get further into the engine. Okay, so now we've got the crankshaft in and now we need to put the piston in. So I've marked this with a smiley face and the arrow down. The arrow always faces towards the uh, lifter valley or the pushrod galley right here. So let's get these rod bolts off. And you'll notice on the ARC connecting rods, there's two dots that will index this rod into the engine. And, you know, I see a lot of guys asking, you know, how do, how do I put my piston on the rod? You know, how do I make sure it's right? Well, the dipper here goes like this and moves oil this way. So it's got to come down into the crankcase and flip the oil up. So that arrow always goes down. As long as the dipper's down, you're good. I'm going to put a little... A little bit of oil on this. <coughs> you guys got me choked up. But I, I don't want too much oil on these rings here. I'm just going to work this oil in a little bit. Then I'm going to make sure that the gaps are 180 degrees apart. I know that there's a lot of speculation on how to, you know, do that properly and make sure that... <coughs> their index correctly and some guys say it don't matter it's what I've always done with V8s and everything else so if it ain't broke don't fix it so I'm gonna take my ring compressor and I'm gonna loop this up a little bit I'm gonna put the ring compressor on here and I'm just gonna go right down to about the wrist pin on this and then we'll tighten it down A lot of times you'll you'll see these overlap a little bit. I want these pretty flat as you're going to slam this piston down through the cylinder. I'm just going to take one drop of oil, go in my cylinder. And you know I don't like to get dirty, so I'm just going to go ahead and wipe my hands off. I use just a dab of assembly lube on the bearing and that's just one little tiny drop 
just to give a little bit. You don't want too much here because it'll uh, help the oil from coming in here once you fire it up. So I'm just going to set this down in here. I want to be careful to get this square in the bore, and apparently I'm not doing that. It must have shrunk in the wash. You guys try and do this live. All right, there we go. Now I'm going to make sure that my my rods aligned by looking at that little dot right there. I'm going to take a, a, a rubber hammer, and this rubber hammer will allow me to hit that rod home. And I want to make sure that I'm going to miss the crank, make sure the crank's all the way in. And of course the bearing fell out, so we'll need to clean the back side of that and make sure that we get the tang in the proper position. This is hard live, guys. I don't know if you know that or not. All right, so I've got that bearing in, and I'm going to move this piston up a little bit just so I get on the crank journal here. All right, so now I'm on the crank uh, journal and the rod seated against the crank. It's important that when before you start torquing these rod bolts, just to give them a little squirt of oil too. And I'm gonna put a little oil on the bottom side of this but we're going to come back and squirt some more oil in here. All right, so we'll get the cap lined up, and you can see the two dots at the bottom, I hope. And I don't want to, I, I want to be very careful and take these bolts in by hand to get them started. I, I don't want to, you know, just start jumping on them right away real quick. And if you have big fingers like mine and big everything like mine, well, not everything, um, you got to move it around a little bit just to get it, everything started. And it's hard when your hands are slippery and there's oil all over, but we'll get it. I just want to make sure that these bolts are not cross-threaded. Then we can start. I've got my torque wrench here. I preset it to 70 inch pounds, and that's where I'm going to start here. Well, I don't think I can get the wrench in there without these bolts in here more. So I'll use the socket and be smarter than I look. But we're going to start at 70 inch pounds on this to get it going. And then we're going to work our way up to 170 inch pounds. And in my year and a half at OMB Warehouse, I've seen two people break these rod bolts. Um, I, I sent them to Jody over at ARC for Christmas presents um, because uh, both of us are a little uh, dumbfounded about how somebody can uh, break one of these ARP rod bolts. I think they're, I don't know, 170,000 PSI or something like that. Something crazy. Yeah, and if you guys are putting comments up there, I can't see them. So now's your time to talk trash, Angelo. So I'm going to slowly start turning these down. Kind of keep them even as I go. Snug on that one. Now that we're snug on the other one, the other one's loosened up. So I'll get my socket back in there. Maybe. Okay. 
So we're going to get that other one snugged up a little bit. And it's important to have a, if you can see this, a quarter inch 12 point socket here. That's what the ARP rod bolts on the ARC rods take. Okay, we're at 90 foot pounds there. I mean 90 inch pounds. Sorry about that. Then I'm going to take this up to 110. I'm going to go in, in 20 inch pound increments. And this is not something that you need to do fast or you even want to do fast. You can just go as slow as you want. Okay, so from 110, we'll go to 130. And yeah, it's good to use a quality torque wrench on this. You know, I, I talked to Jody, and Jody uses a Harbor Freight torque wrench. But one thing about those wrenches is you need to break them in. They use a real stiff uh, lubricant on the clicker on these. Okay. So as long as it's broke in, it'll be accurate. I picked up this fancy Mac brand at the swap meet from some guys, probably stolen, but uh, it works really well. Okay, and now the final torque to 170. And yes, I am sweating. This is hard to do without my big fat head in the way, especially with this clown hat too. Sometimes you get a false torque reading because it's two bolts. So I would like to go back and just click it one more time. I, I know there's, there's a lot of speculation about that. That's not needed. That's how I do it. Um, if you've got a better way, I'm all ears. What are you guys saying about me? Oh, Durant. Good to see you, brother. Oh, this scan is going to run good. Yeah. Okay. All right. So we've got the piston in. Everything's spinning freely. So now what I want to do is put my lifters in. So many guys fumble around with this and struggle with it. I just take my block and I turn it up like this. I'm going to use a little bit of assembly lube just where the push rod goes in. But I also want some on the bottom here. This is one of the higher wear parts of a brand new engine. So... Once we get this in, we can stick these lifters down in. And now it's time to put it in the cam. Like I told you guys before, I'm using the Mod 2 Dyno Cam. Put the hammer away. Um, Mod, Mod 2 stock lift, just a lot of duration, very mild cam. Um, I, I think it'll be good for this build. So from here... We have a dot on the crankshaft. We need to move that dot out to right about the four o'clock position because there's a dot on the cam that we need to line up with that. So with the cam, I want to put a little loop where this journal rides on the block. And then I'm going to loop both the uh, lobes and then a little bit on the outside too. Now, I took, took some heat on another website that uh, I don't use enough uh, fancy tools on this stuff and have a lot of knowledge, but um, I, I would like to think that I'm appealing to the backyard builder, just like myself, or the front yard the old gray goat. So I'm going to get my cam into the block, and I'm just going to line those two up, and then I'm just going to put it home. You may have to turn it a little bit to verify that the dot on the cam, which is between two teeth, is on the dot with the tooth. 
like that, if you can see that. Okay, so that's all there is to it. This is easy. Anybody can do it. Just ask somebody that's never done it. So now, uh, essentially, the, the bottom end's complete. The cam's in, the lifters are in. Um, I've got the crank in. I'm using my flywheel just for, for fun, just to spin things. And at this point, we can put the side cover on. I know a guy that makes gaskets, and he made some gaskets for me at uh, 28 thousandths, which is about the same as a stock gasket. So I'm going to put that on. I'm also going to put a little oil on these gears. And I'm going to squirt some oil right down there on the rod, just so there's plenty of oil in here. And I got to get this seal here and the berry. Because like I said, all this stuff's been cleaned. You want to keep that, that seal lube. You don't want that dry starting either. So now I'm just going to put this side cover on. And then we'll get the bolts in here. Okay, we'll let the bolts suck that down a little bit. One thing I'm going to be concerned about once we get the, the side cover on, get it properly torqued down to 94 inch pounds, is the movement of the crankshaft. For my uh, stuff, I like to measure the in and out play. If it's got too much play on the crankshaft, what that does, because the, the gear on the, the crank and the cam are beveled, you, you can get some different cam timing and uh, a little different performance. And I'd rather have it consistent, even for my junk. And like I mentioned before, I don't like using power tools to do this stuff. I always do this by hand in case there's something cross-threaded or in case there's some interference in the engine. I don't want to be the cause of the failure. Okay. So we're going to back this off. We're going to start this at 60 inch pounds. And if you have old eyes, you can appreciate me not being able to see this. Okay. When I'm torquing the side cover, I like to go on a crisscross pattern. So I'll start here and go here and go here and go here, go here and go here. Or, or something like that. It's just something like that. Okay, so we're at 60 inch pounds there. I'll just double check this just for my for my viewing audience. Okay. I'll just take the next one right up to 94 inch pounds. That is uh, what's specced out for this engine. So we'll start here. Go here. All right, and now we have to see how much movement play is in this crankshaft. So I know some guys on Jody's videos wanted to see some better tools. So if we want to do this right, we'll use our dial indicator. And I want to snug these down. 
just to make sure that the base is solid. This is a little piece of metal that I made, but I painted it silver because I knew I was going to be on Facebook Live. So we take our dial indicator. Brand new one. I'm not used to it yet. Sorry. And then we'll get it right on to the end of the crankshaft. And I'm going to push this crank all the way down and in. I'm going to get the plunger on there. And then at this point, I'm going to move the crank in and out after I zero this out. I've got 12 thousandths. Um, typically, 10 thousandths is acceptable. But we're a little bit thick on that. We have some shims at ombwarehouse.com. And make sure you like us. I don't know if I have a 2,000 shim here, though. Getting out the big guns, David. You guys about ready for another question, too? Okay, I've got a shim that's two and a half thousandths. So what I'm going to do is I'm going to take everything back apart. And take the engine apart. If you're going to build it right, build it once and build it right. This is what caused uh, Old Man Wolf's uh, Raptor to blow up. They didn't check the end play on the crank. You can also buy thinner side cover gaskets, uh, not, not for the non-Hemi, but for the Hemi and the clones and the GX200 engines. And uh, those work really well uh, if you have too much in play on your crank. And just because I'm live, what's going to happen is the, uh, the cam's going to fall out when I take everything else out. You guys getting ready for Prismo? I got another question coming right at you right now. George is ahead right now, one to nothing. Okay. I don't care if the crank falls out, that would be fine with me, or the cam, but uh, we're good. So I'm actually not going to use this gasket. Now I forgot which, which shim is the correct one. Let me get back to the higher quality tools. That's two and a half thousandths. So I'm just going to stick this shim right on here, right next to the crank gear. I always like to start my builds with a with a few gaskets. Um, and you got you guys know I've already told you I like to keep it clean, so I don't want this thing to leak once I have it all together. So we'll get the side cover back on. And we'll get our bolts back in. You could probably reuse the, the same gasket you just used. I always like to, to use a fresh one because I, I, uh, I know a little bit about gaskets. And I just, once they're compressed, they're compressed. And uh, they're not going to come back from that. So we'll just use a fresh gasket on this. Gaskets are cheap. Side cover gaskets, two, three bucks. Not a big deal when you're considering the uh, amount of money that goes into the rest of this. All right, so when I get ready to torque this, we're going to do another question right now. How am I doing on time? Oh, we're doing good. Hell, Cliff, we might get this fired up. All right. Bottom of the engines together. Let's get another question in the pipe, guys. 
the Flexo mini bike company uh, was based in Los Angeles. Um, Flexos, uh, they built carts and uh, mini bikes, um, made pretty cute little stuff, but uh, they were based in Los Angeles. What is the name of the street that they were on? They were in Los Angeles. What is the name of the street they were on? Yeah, I'm not done yet, Mo. No, Flexo Mini Bike Company was based in Los Angeles. What's the name of the street they were on? Taco. And I was rocking out. Okay, Flexo Mini Bikes. What's the name of the street that they were on? Nope, no, not even close. Flexo. Dude, it's, it's an iconic street. And I want the street name. Come on, guys. Th this is iconic Los Angeles stuff here. What was the name of the street? Oh, Chad White Knight in the house. Venice Boulevard. You guys know Venice Beach? Come on, everybody knows Venice Beach. Yep, they were uh, Venice Boulevard, not all Venice Beach. Uh, uh, some of it's uh, not great. So Chad White Knight in the house with Venice Boulevard. Okay, so we got a, uh, a two-way tie going on right now. All right, so we got to take these side cover bolts out to uh, 94 inch pounds. So doesn't matter where you start, just give it a little crisscross action. It's a lot easier than doing a V8 on a stand the numbers are a lot bigger the stands are a lot scarier okay so 94 inch pounds is where we're going you gotta you gotta trust in the chinese on this one and i feel like i missed one so i'm just gonna go back and check them all Bingo about a bingo. How's that? All right. Let's get the fancy tools out of here. And get my shims back out of the way. One thing I haven't mentioned to you guys, for you Coleman guys, I have the sprocket adapters in stock right now. This will take the standard cart sprocket that, with the five and a quarter inch six bolt pattern. Uh, I've got a 35 sprocket on this. I was doing some other stuff with it. But this bolts right onto the flange of a Coleman or a Baja Warrior Heat um, or uh, WB65. And this will allow you to get rid of your stock 50 tooth sprocket. You can go a 40 uh, for more top speed. You can go with a 54 that will give you um, a little more torque. Or you can go with a 60, which will pull a trailer. So these are in stock right now at the warehouse. Um, it's in the Coleman section or the MB200 section. If you need help finding it, you email me help at ombwarehouse.com and say, hey, great goat, I need that sprocket adapter, big boy. And uh, what I'm going to do is I'm going to show you how to find that sprocket adapter. So that'll be good. A lot of Coleman guys out there right now wanting to do different things and go fast. So I'm going to take a little bit of carburetor cleaner, and I'm going to clean up the mating surface on this head. I want this absolutely clean before I put the gasket on. I'm also going to take my head and make sure that it's clean. Now, one thing you guys, I get a lot of questions about, hey, 
my Predator head gasket doesn't fit. Well, what I did was I, I dremeled out this hole right here at the bottom so it fits over the pins. That's a very common thing with the Predator engines, whether Hemi or not Hemi, um, is to make sure that, uh, you know, the, the gasket fits over there. This is real hard to drill with a drill bit. A lot of times it'll go in and it'll get twisted and mess up the gasket. Dremel tool works perfect on this, opens that hole up. If, if you have that situation, don't worry about it. Uh, just drill it out, call it a day. So I'm going to get some of the oil off of this. It's all over my hands. You can see the gasket slides on there nice and easy. I've already got the bolts in the head. So I'm going to watch them go into the dowel pins first. I'm located on the pins. Now we can start this. We're going to torque uh, the head to 17 foot pounds. So that's why I've got the big daddy wrench out here. But uh, we'll just use these to get one of them snug so this head stays on the block okay. And another thing I've noticed that, you know, with using a, a 14cc head or using different heads on different blocks, sometimes the tins won't fit correctly. So at, at that point, I get out the side, the uh, sheet metal cutters and I cut them. Easy peasy. All right, so we're going to get these snug down. As you can see, I've already got the, the rockers installed. I've got the stainless valves with the aluminum retainers. These are 18-pound Honda springs. Um, one, one thing I, I see a lot on Facebook, and, you know, everything on the Internet's true, is that so many guys think that uh, if I run a stiff valve spring, that's just going to give me more power through the magic of the um, spring gods. Now, springs don't give you more power. Springs actually take more power to, to run. Okay. So I'm going to start these off. These are 17 foot-pounds. I'm starting off at 12. And then I'm just going to bring this up to 17, and then we'll give it a final go. Long block nearly complete now. This is easy. Right? Anybody can do it. So what I like to do for my push rods, I've got the stainless steel push rods, is just to give the, the tips just a little bit, because these are the one of the last things that's going to get lubricated on the top end especially. So we're just going to help it live a little bit. Doesn't take a whole bunch. Probably overdid it on that one. And then i got to get my fat head here in the way. And you'll, you'll know once you're down on the lifter, I'm going to have to get me a flashlight for this because I can't see. I got my chipper size flashlight right here. Okay. Now, one, once the push rod's in correctly, it'll actually suck down into that that lifter a little bit so you'll, you'll know once it's in there I always like to verify with a flashlight but yep we're, we're good and stuck in there now I know that when I put my cam in I'm still at top dead center so I'm just gonna take these adjusting nuts and just tighten them down a little bit because we're, we're gonna need to go back and adjust these so I don't want them too snug but uh, right there um, when you're doing a, a Hemi Predator, it's a ton easier to adjust the valves than on a non-Hemi. Um, something about those adjusters, they, they don't tighten down. What I'll do on these is I'll tighten these down. I'll turn the engine a couple rotations. Then I'll come back and I'll recheck. So I'm going to make sure I'm at top dead center on the compression stroke. 
And we can do that quite easily just by turning the flywheel and my thumbs over the spark plug hole. I see it's sucking down right now, so I don't want that. I wanted to push my thumb off the hole. And then I'm going to make sure that the, the piston's all the way up in the top of the cylinder by looking down through the spark plug hole. Now I'm at top dead center on the compression stroke. We got to do another question because we're running out of time. All right, you guys, get your Googles ready. Berkeley Engineering produced a bike called the Savage Scooter. Um, that, that was the base model, the Savage Scooter by Berkeley Engineering. What engine came on the base model Savage? All right, we got some history for you guys today, mini bike history. What engine came on the Savage Scooter? That's the base model. Yeah, Duran, those uh, those ARC flywheels are too pretty to put under the cover. Um, and Tim, you be quiet. He is learning something. The Berkeley Engineering Savage Scooter. What engine came on the base model Savage? Good luck with that one, guys. OG in the house. Mo Trout, A400. Get down with your bad self, Mo Trout. The base model Savage Scooter came with the Clinton A400 engine. So good, good job, Mo. That was a good pull there, brother. You are kind of a mean human being, but uh, I still like you. So most all dyno cams, you set the lash to 0 0.003 inches or three thousandths. Um, I've, I've already got the, the three thousandths out. I'm going to work my feeler gauge after I back these off because I forgot to put the lash caps in. And I told myself, Eric, don't forget the lash caps. These lash caps are itty bitty teeny tiny and they're very easy to drop in the engine. So while you're doing this procedure, I should probably go all the way off and get off the push rod and drop the adjuster nut where I can't get it. That would be great, right? Or not. See, I already dropped this one down in here. A little squirt of oil on the tops will help those stick a little bit. All right, so ARC makes these uh, little tiny hardened lash caps for these. Um, they're a little bit thinner than a stock lash cap to fit with the uh, with the split lock retainers. I'm not going to lose this adjusting nut. And I'm not going to lose this retainer, right? Right. Okay, now I can get these back down on here. I'm just going to snug them down to hold everything in place. And see, these feeler gauges are so thin that there's two of them stuck together here, and I didn't even know it. One thing about the aluminum blocks versus, uh, you know, you tell an automotive guy, yeah, it's three thousandths, and they're going to look at you like you're insane. But uh, because the block expands, we can go tight on these. All right, so I'm just going to get this feeler gauge down between the lash cap and the tip of the rocker, and I'm just going to get it to where this is snug coming in and out. I'm going to back it off a little bit. The issue that I have with the non-hemis is that when you tighten everything down, it tends to tighten everything down. The hemis are a lot easier than the non-hemi. I'm going to come back and recheck and see I'm already tight. So I'm just going to take my bigger wrench and I'm going to back off this till I can get my feeler gauge in there. Just make sure that it slides through there with, uh, with a little bit of resistance. And now I'm going to retighten this nut here.
See, it tightened up again on me. Okay, there we go. I see, I'm not liking that. With the non-hemis, I've had it on occasion where I've had to do them several times. You know, what I'm going to do also is after I get this done, I'm going to take and rotate the engine two full rotations to get back on the compression stroke. And then I'm going to adjust it again, make sure that it's right. The biggest issue that, that I have in, in customer service is people that put a new cam in, a, in an engine, never check the valve lash, start breaking the cord. Helicopter. Snug that down, good to go. Now we can go to the exhaust side, except for that nut that I lost went uh, into no man's land and it's nowhere to be seen. So we'll get that, we'll get the exhaust side done later. The exhaust is the most important side to get done on this because of the compression release on the cam. If this is too loose, the lifter is never gonna hit the compression release and it's gonna be real hard to pull and then you'll start breaking your ropes and uh, then things won't be great for you. So essentially we're done. You know, I'm a fan of new gaskets. So I got uh, new gaskets here. Don't know how this goes on, but we'll figure it out. It goes on like that. Then we're gonna put another gasket and I wanna make sure that the, the gasket's oriented correctly for this application. And this little passage right here, this is an overflow for the float bowl. So if you had a problem with your float, it'll leak the fuel out here and it'll drop, drop straight down. So I want to get that on correctly. Make sure that uh, and then I can get the billet air filter adapter. I always start by putting the choke bracket on first because that way I know which which ends up right but I need that heavy gasket and I don't know what I did with it but that's it you guys know how to do the rest of that that was easy right we got questions to do we got a three-way tie everybody's losing right now so let me get back here In my big comfy chair, and you know, mini bike Joe Joe uh, Sebergandia that does the uh, Joe's mini bike reunion. He sits in a chair. Big uh, old uh, Ed, uh, evil Ed sits in a chair, and then you guys quack at me because uh, I sit in a chair. Come on, guys! If Joe can do it, I can do it, right? All right, we got questions now. We got one more. We got a three-way tie, so you guys got to get busy. I like my old West Bend engines. And uh, the old two strokes, uh, love them and hate them all at the same time. With the uh, the West Bends in particular, they made the they had a rookie 500. They came out with a 580, a 585 port, which George has, and um, then they had a 700, and then they went to the 610, and then the 820. Um, the 820s uh, a pretty awesome running little motor, and um, there there is some history behind it. You know, West Bend used to make your mom's cookware, but then the military war effort, they got into making engines because they were so good at casting aluminum. So anyway, West Bend engines are also referred to as what more retail friendly name? West Bend engines are referred to as what more retail friendly name? Yeah, I, I, I see you, OG Wildcat. Power B, Simple Tom in the house. Three-way tie. Come on, guys. Um, yeah, when Chrysler bought it, I, but, they, you know, I, I've seen stickers that say West Bend Power B. So 
I, I think it might have been before the Chrysler days is when they labeled them as uh, Power B. Yeah, but it is U.S. Motor Power right now. And um, uh, still uh, a, a fine engine and uh, well worth the money. But I think they're getting a little expensive at uh, U.S. Uh, motor Power. So we're running out of time. So we're going to do one more question. And uh, we've got George, Chad, Mo Trout, and Tom in the house. Everybody's got one. So come on. Um, the best exhaust to run on a 212 depends on what you've done to it. It's just that easy. What fits in your frame? What are you doing with it? What's been done to the engine? There is no one exhaust that uh, works for a 20 horse engine or an eight horse engine. So yeah, you got to, uh, you got to do a little research on that. So, um, Sean Reed, good to see you, sir. Um, okay. Last question. Four way tie. This one's easy for these predator engines. What is the rate of the stock Predator 212 valve spring in pounds? What's the rating on a stock 212 Predator spring in pounds? I get some water. I've been talking. Like us on Facebook. We like that. And Mo Trout in the house. 10.8 pounds. That is um, what the stock springs are. They're kind of light. You can go in, one, one, in your fingers. Um, you know, you take an 18 pound spring, you're going, oink, oink. And then you take a 26 pound spring, and you're going, Ugh. so that's how we roll here. So, Mo Trout, congratulations. Mo, you'll need to email me help at ombwarehouse.com. Um, say, hey, Greg Goat, sup. And then uh, you and I'll get that taken care of. Uh, if Clay, Harold, if you're on here, your stuff's in the mail. Um, Simple Tom, your stuff's in the mail. Okay? So, and Jason, woodchucks can't chuck wood. That's not what they do. They just hang out and they chill, like we do here in the Grego Garage here in beautiful Southern California. Anyway, like us on Facebook. That's important for us. If you guys want to keep seeing my pretty face every week, like us on Facebook. Um, subscribe to old uh, ombwarehouse.com. And uh, hang out with the uh, crazies over at oldminibikes.com. You can see a $20,000 minibike over there. Uh, just tell uh, Dr. Shopkeeper that I sent you. And um, we, we've got a, a great community there. And uh, they're all minibike-centric. And you guys will see me start building up this um, Bare Bones Gilson over here that's going to be the orange crush when I'm done. So I'm going to get a torque converter. And uh, this motor that uh, we just built behind us, and uh, hopefully it'll be a good scooter. So I'm going to work on hydraulic brakes, and I'm not going to go to the machine shop and have $1,000 hub adapters made. Um, I'm, I'm going to do it the uh, old school uh, backyard redneck way because I am a redneck from way back. So, um, yeah, no, I saw that, Randy. I, I understood that uh, Randy has the old uh, Copperhead Gilson. Um, Pete sure puts a lot of time and, and a lot of love into uh, his builds. So, you know, I commend him on that. And I know he won his um, his class at the OMB Old Mini Bikes build off this year. So I am Eric, the gray goat, but I am also help at ombwarehouse.com. If you have any questions on tonight's build, if you, if you need any help with anything, um, I, I don't know it all, but I'm getting smarter by the day. So if you email me, um, I always get back to you and I always do my very best for you. So, you know, if you're doing some wild combination of things, we'll do what we can to help you out. So, you know, just let us know. But I am help at ombwarehouse.com. Um, we, uh, we work very, very hard every day to make sure that we're getting you the right products uh, in a timely fashion and at a good price. Remember, free shipping over $99. Uh, who does that? Flat rate shipping. Buy, buy a, buy a go-kart seat and you get flat rate shipping at $7.99. If it's over $99, we ship it for free. You just got to click that little box right down there. But anybody can click a little box. It's easy, right? Right. I'm not that cool where I wear shades all the time. It's just my glasses. And Southern California is so beautiful all the time that, um, you know, I, I can, you know, put on my lay while I'm talking on Facebook Live. So thank you for stopping by tonight. I, I do appreciate you guys. If you have any questions on tonight's build or if you're concerned about your own or if you're planning on a build, let me know. 
you know, we, we have a lot of ready to go kits that you just, you know, click and buy and done. Um, and then you got to do the hard work. But uh, if you want something a little bit different or a little bit crazy, email me, help at ombwarehouse.com. I am Eric. I do the help. And we are OMB Warehouse. Uh, we're very hardworking. We're very proud of, of what we can do for you. And please reach out to us if you can. And thank you for stopping by tonight. I appreciate each and every one of you. And um, Jake, you got to be special. You, you have to be able to email Eric at help at ombwarehouse.com and say, hey, Greg Goat, sup? And then, um, you know, I, I, I got connections. So, Yes, and yes, Charles, the seven ninety nine. I, I get some people not happy with that sometimes, but what can you do? Flat rate seven ninety nine. It's easy that way. There's there's nothing, uh, nothing, no hidden agenda there. You know, I, I I've bought from other sites before, and then when I go to check out the the, the shipping on a little item is standard at fourteen dollars. Seven ninety nine flat rate here at the OMB warehouse. We're here to help you. I am the help. We are ombwarehouse.com. Like us on Facebook, and I will see you next week. Thank you very much. Have a good evening. Bye-bye. You'll never find another love like mine.